Hey, greetings, everyone. It's GleeCon, and I'm back staring in your face like this dish of food that we have in front of us, staring me in the face, just making me hungry, even though uh, I just had some food. Um, hey, welcome. Uh, on the last episode of this old show, this old house, lore, lore of Warcraft, we we took young Callie, the Menethil, before she died, and we ran her through a spooky little land called Duskwood. Uh, we killed some spiders. We killed some wolves. Uh, we may have inadvertently killed a, a wolf or two or maybe a ghoul. Probably not. She tried to tiptoe past the baddies uh, as we kind of got into that zone, which is a fun one to level in. Uh, rehashed a little bit of territory that we did with Erator and Tomorrow Eve, we will pick up with Erator as well to continue that journey because they're going to be they're going to be duoing it, teaming it up, doing uh, alternating episodes. On the last episode of our reading, we continued the first volume, the fourth issue of the World of Warcraft official magazine. Uh, we're going to kick off the final part. I'm going to try to bust out the rest of this one in this episode tonight, uh, and then we'll just have one more uh, magazine left to go in this interesting journey last time we read well it's sometimes hard for me to remember uh even things that happened two days ago <laughs> we read so much and play so much just scrolling up I, I remember now it was a lot of crafting it was out of game crafting it was um if you kind of scroll back up some it was people that make clay and plushies and food and a company that makes posters and we also read looked at some of the art from mm -hmm. uh Samwise Didier, who is a uh, famous artist who's done a lot of the work that we've already looked at in this game. Um, some of the, the art, that whole world of World of Warcraft slash Blizzard art is something that's near and dear to me. I love it. I have a couple of the art books in person, um, and I look forward to exploring some of that stuff in the future as well, because it really is just a treat. Mm -hmm. Those ones, when we do get there, I, I, I will recommend uh, maybe popping the YouTube up, not just in the background, just so you can see, but um, by all means, peruse at your pleasure. Hey, engage however you want. You guys are all awesome. Um, can't thank you enough. It's a, it's always a pleasure. So let's dive right in. Stay a while. And listen, this is called Dark Iron Chef. Learn to craft in-game dishes in your own kitchen. Uh, I don't know how much I'd want to do that. Some of it, sure, but the deeper and deeper we get, particularly in Shadowlands, the food just sounds disgusting. So, uh, even now, like in Duskwood, we're making spider kebabs and stuff like that, so I guess be careful. Um, it's not like Zelda where you're making, like, you know, tasty steamed rice balls or whatever. No, you're making, uh, white spider meat and spider icker in your food and stuff like that so this all this all this stuff looks pretty good now i will i'll also add a caveat if this is anything like the dungeons and dragons cookbook uh can't remember the name heroes feast is what i think it's called oh gosh i cooked my way through that entire cookbook every single recipe and i would say 90% of it was disappointing. This food does look like medieval fare. Unfortunately, with except for these cucumbers, that seems intriguing. Looks like cilantro, maybe like a, some kind of a tuna or crab or chicken. We're going to read about it. I need this mushrooms, sure. Um, the meatballs look like they could be good. But a lot of this stuff looks bland, and it was very bland, a lot of it uh, in the Heroes Feast. So, you know, stews, chicken thighs, potatoes. So let's kick it off. With all due respect to common and orcish, food is a universal language throughout Azeroth. Whether a group of friends is sharing a romantic picnic basket or you're scarfing down a fish feast before toppling Cinder Ghost of the cooking skill brings players together, awards achievements, and provides useful buffs. While there may not be an Azeroth aisle in your local supermarket yet, Many players have found ways to bring the in-game recipes to life. With a little creativity, inspiration from fellow gamers, and our recipes, you'll be able to throw a World of Warcraft dinner party that would even impress Catherine Lee? Uh, maybe that's... Oh, I think that's a cooking trainer. 
There's nothing we can't cook, says Shelby Roach, who plays on the Dark Iron U.S. realm, along with her husband, John. Shelby has been crafting their take on Warcraft menu items since 2007. The old John with no H. One of my best friends is a John Sans H. Shelby and John have been playing since the open beta, but neither brings any professional culinary experience into the kitchen, choosing to let their taste buds guide them. We'll often start out with a basic existing recipe to determine any additional ingredients we might need, John says. We then try to match up the in-game ingredients with a real-world counterpart like substituting crab for spider legs in the case of the gooey spider cake. Maybe that's what we're seeing. From there, John explains it's a lot of trial and error. Sometimes the couple has to rework a recipe over and over until they're satisfied that it lives up to the game's model, but their ambition and determination always went out in the end. Come on, give us some real giant spiders. We actually actually ended up doing a Winter Vale feast for a family gathering, John says. The spread included chocolate squares, Winter Vale roast, cookies, eggnog, and Shelby's favorite dish, spice bread. It was a pretty big hit, even with the non-gamers in attendance. Yeah, that helps. I mean, how, you can't go wrong with chocolate, a roast, cookies, eggnog, spice bread. The Texas couple aren't the only gourmets who enjoy the holiday spirit. Brewmaster Funden of Hydro U.S. recently lived up to his title when he threw a brew fest party with his friends. We had root beer and steins instead. Okay. And a friend who bought, brought fake mustaches. Funden says we also had a sample of, or the closest we could get to, the foods needed for the Brewfest diet achievement. That's actually pretty cool. Actually get all the stuff you'd need for the Achieve. To round out the festivities, Funden organized a foot race to simulate the holiday ram races. Oh my gosh. Eat a bunch of food, drink a bunch of brew, and then have a foot race? Oh man. <laughs> Running around the living room or donning a dwarven mustache doesn't make a great dinner party by itself, though it can't hurt. The proof is on the plate. Using Shelby's and John's techniques, Funden's spirit, and our recipes as a jumping off point, you'll have everything you need to become a grandmaster cook. All right, we have for appetizers. First, we have red versus blue. Sulfuron Slammers makes it one drink. Sold by Plugger Spazring and Blackrock Depths, this drink promises to set you on fire here we opt for fire safety with only a touch of flames Everclear is extremely flammable so completely wipe down the sides of the glass and table before lighting always blow out the flame gently but completely before drinking use the thick shot glass to avoid cracking for a non-alcoholic version top peppermint cocoa with whipped cream mixed with a few drops of orange food coloring if you use one and a quarter ounce of kalua or coffee liqueur half an ounce of cinnamon schnapps and a quarter ounce of Everclear. You really, you're just putting that kind of like floater on top for the burn. Pour the Kahlua into a two-ounce shot glass. Layer with cinnamon schnapps and then Everclear. Carefully light the edge of the shot glass. You may need to dim the lights to see the blue flame. Carefully and completely blow out the flame. The rim of the shot glass will be hot. Shoot the drink. <laughs> uh, that does not sound pleasant to me. That sounds like heartburn. But hey, I'm game. I'll try anything once. Spiced chili crab. Hey, I'll, I'll try anything two to three times, really. Makes 24. The Alliance should plan ahead and purchase this level 40 recipe when questing in Westfall and stored in the bank, while the Horde can pick it up in Swamp of Sorrows or Stranglethorn Vale. This version uses the flavors of a popular Singapore street food and pairs it with cucumbers. So that's what we've seen at the top. Um, that provide a refreshing relief from the strong heat of that Thai chilies. If you're hesitant about the heat, you can start with one or two chilies and add more to taste. I love hot, spicy stuff. So it takes six red Thai chilies without the stems, garlic cloves. I'm not going to read every single recipe, but by all means, check out the blurry screenshot if you want them. Ketchup, sugar, red paste, tomato paste. Uh, then they use... Crab meat packed over fat cartilage. Mm. Some spring onions, that's a Thai thing, sliced or green onions if you can't get them. Cilantro chopped up and then two English cucumbers. In the food processor, finely chop the chili and garlic, add the ketchup, sugar, red miso and lime juice, puree until evenly incorporated. I missed the miso somewhere in that. Um, I don't even see that on the recipe. Maybe that's the, yeah. I don't, oh, I see that. It's red miso paste. 
Uh, wash the cucumbers drying with a towel afterward, leaving the skin on. Cut them into one inch thick slices. Gently press the cucumber slices with a paper towel to absorb some of the water with a melon baller or a spoon. Scoop out a small crater in the center of the slice about three quarters of the way through. Be careful not to carve through the opposite side. Fill each cucumber with a heaping mound of crab mixture. Sprinkle with remaining cilantro. Can be refrigerated, covered in plastic an hour ahead. Cucumbers will leak water. So do not store on an intending serving plate. That's a good tip. Sounds good. I like crab meat and I like cucumbers, so sounds delish to me. Critter bites. This North Rend recipe gives you control over critters, but our version will have guests, not just turkeys and squirrels, following you around the room. The grape jelly adds a surprising sweetness that pairs with the spice from the chipotle and barbecue sauce. Okay, so it's meatballs. You dip ground beef, ground pork, breadcrumbs, mm -hmm. little milk, red onion, egg, uh, and then to spice it up and make it more than just a regular meatball, because if, if anyone that cooks, you can tell that's essential basic meatball with onion. Uh, adobo sauce uh, and chipotle peppers in adobo sauce. You can get that like in a can. I cook with that a lot. Uh, salt, vegetable oil, and flat leaf parsley chopped up. The sauce is just a, any spicy barbecue sauce mixed with grape jelly. That actually sounds pretty good. With your hands, combine the first nine ingredients, the ground beef through the salt, so everything's evenly dispersed. Form the meat into one and a half inch ball, hand rolling with gentle, gentle pressure over medium heat. Barely cover the bottom of the pan with oil. Heat the oil until it's hot but not smoking. Working in batches, add the meatballs to the pan without crowding. Brown on all sides and cook through. Set aside the cooked meatballs. Scrape up and discard any scraps from the pan. Add more oil if necessary and repeat until all the meatballs are cooked, if making ahead of time. Sometimes I would leave the scraps in there. It gives a, some char in there. I, I kind of like that sometimes. If making ahead of time, cool to room temperature, then cover and refrigerate. You can make them a day ahead, but then you're going to have cold meatballs. Uh, I mean, people eat that at parties all the time. If refrigerated, bring the meatballs to room temp in a large saucepan over medium-low heat. Whisk together the barbecue sauce and the grape jelly. Add the meatballs, tossing to coat in the sauce and heat through. Once warmed, Keep on the stove over a low heat, stirring occasionally until ready to serve. Sprinkle with chopped parsley and serve with toothpicks. I don't know about whatever. I think I would make my own style of meatball however I would want. But I do like that concept of the meat added the heat, you know, to the with the adobo sauce and then this barbecue jelly. I would I would try that. I would try it. All right, now we're on to the main dishes. This just looks like a straight chicken thigh right here with, over some potatoes. <clears throat> Maybe a little salsa on top, a little homemade salsa. It looks like a fruit salsa. Dirge's Kicking Chimerock Chops. Oh, it's pork chops, not, not chicken thigh. Speak to Dirge Quick Cleave and Tanaris for the quest that will reward you with the only epic cooking recipe in the game to date. Dirge uses hard-to-farm Chimerock Tenderloin, while we opt for the easier-to-find pork chops. However, even Dirge would envy the heat these bring. Goblin fuel has nothing on the combination of habanero, rum, brown sugar, and pineapple that kicks up the grilled meat. The alcohol in the rum will cook off, or you can substitute a low sodium chicken stock. Yeah, I cook with alcohol all the time and feed it to kids or whatever, and that's just good parenting right there. <laughs> all right, so the for the rib cut pork chops, that's why they're looking like that. Uh, marinade is vegetable oil, garlic, salt, pepper. Yeah, put the, then I'm sure you'd soak the, yeah, it says in a zip top bag or plastic container, combine the marinated chops, toss into a coat, refrigerate overnight. I usually use a bag, but I, I mean, it's more sustainable not to. For the relish that you're putting on top, there you go, it's pineapple. So it is a fruit kind of relish. They're calling it bell pepper, cilantro, and the habanero. That's like a heat, but it's really more sweet than anything else. And then you, you glaze with the dark rum, pineapple juice, and brown sugar. Heat a grill to 450 or a cast iron pan over medium high heat and sear the pork chops on both sides. Scrape off the garlic pit pieces if you're cooking in a pan so they're not going to burn. Reduce to 400 or medium and cook until the internal temp reaches 160. Cover loosely on foil and let it rest for five minutes. While the meat rests in a large saucepan over medium high heat, combine rum, pineapple, brown sugar, stir frequently until the glaze thickens. It just says any dark rum. Pour a glass over pork chops and liberally top with relish. Now I would have to say what dark rum you're going to use is going to really affect um, what you're eating. Now they have it, it looks like spread over chunks of pineapple. Just looking at it, I wonder, like I would maybe, 
consider mixing in a couple plantains or something in there too. It sounds, but it looks good. I would eat the heck out of that. Okay, here we got some sprinkles of bread to the side with a picture of definitely just a stew. Looks like a beef stew. Looks like carrots, parsley. Um, I see some darkness. Maybe that's a spinach that got stewed and then some red onion. They're calling it mystery stew, so we're not supposed to know what's in there. Look at this grilled pineapple chips. That looks good. Um, part of the fun in the stew is the variety of ingredients you can use. The surprise in the desolate recipe in this version is a full-bodied stout that brings depth to the mystery meat. I mean, that's common to cook a stew with a stout. And again, what stout you use or what beer you use when you make your stew really does affect the flavor. Feel free to experiment and make your own by adding potatoes or substituting buffalo meat. Can you even get that? I guess some people probably do. Uh, the alcohol will work off or will cook off so you can replace, or you can replace a stout with low sodium beef broth and two additional prunes. That's what the blackness is in there. It's prunes. So you do lean beef stew meat, um, olive oil, flour, salt, pepper, cayenne, um, red onion, garlic cloves, tomato paste, Guinness, or any kind of stout, Worcestershire sauce, bay leaves, beef broth, carrots, pitted prunes, thyme, parsley. Toss the beef in a tablespoon of oil, mix together with flour, salt, black, and cayenne pepper. Um, dredge the beef in the flour mixture. Heat the remaining oil in a large eight-quart pot or Dutch oven over medium heat. I'd probably do Dutch oven. Saute onions, stirring until soft and then slightly translucent. Add the garlic and saute for 30 seconds. Add the tomato paste to reduce to medium heat. Cover and cook for five minutes. Add the cup of Guinness and deglaze the pan by scraping up any brown bits with a whisk or a wooden spoon. Add the remaining beer and the next six ingredients through time and stir. Reduce the heat to low and cover, keeping it to simmer, stirring occasionally for two to three hours until the meat's tender and pulls apart easily. Remove the bay leaves, sprinkle with parsley, and serve. Okay. Uh, Sporgar mushrooms. So this is just mushrooms. Six servings. I mean, I for me, I wouldn't eat that raw, like straight. I'd, I'd take that. Maybe I'd eat that with some steak or something. But for my vegetarian friends out there, by all means, I did uh, years and years ago, um, back in my college days, I, I went on some dates with a girl who was a vegan. And um, not ashamed to say, I, I just, no shame in my game. Was like, yeah, I'll, I'll eat vegan for sure. I went to some vegan restaurants quite a few times. Uh, but one of the best ones I ever had was like a really nice um, mushroom-like steak. It was actually pretty good with vegan carrot cake. It was pretty dang good. Um, I don't trust myself to cook vegan as well as all that. But Okay, so in World of Warcraft, these little mushrooms found throughout the Outland and Northrend don't grant a buff and are often vendored. However, here, the perk of addition bring a rich earthiness to the meal. You just need a bunch of brown mushrooms. Cut them in half vertically, unsalted butter, salt, pepper, lemon juice, thyme. Preheat the oven to 475, toss the mushrooms in with melted butter, salt, pepper, lemon juice, bake in a baking sheet with foil. Place them in a spring, single layer and, sprinkle, layer and sprinkle with thyme. Bake for eight minutes until they're firm, but easily pierced with a fork and serve. I'd, maybe I'd try grilling that instead too. That might add a little bit more flavor. Rum ton tubers. These tubers, only found within Dyer Mall, receive a real-world interpretation that makes an underappreciated vegetable and turns it into a showstopper. You can substitute carrots or other root vegetables for the parsnips. That's what this is. These are parsnips. They're not. I thought that was a small cut for a pineapple. Um, that's a grilled parsnip. So you need parsnip, <clears throat> olive oil, salt, black pepper, rosemary, which rosemary does pair really well with parsnip. Okay, heat the oven to 400, line two baking tins with foil, grease the baking sheets with cooking spray or a small amount of oil, cut off the ends of the parsnips, cut into quarter inch slices, toss them with olive oil, salt, and pepper, sprinkle liberally with rosemary, bake until they're slightly browned, and fork them in the center and serve. Okay, we have delicious drinks as well. I try that. I'm not the biggest parsnip guy. Like, I haven't, I don't eat them so much, but I've eaten them you know, a handful of times, and uh, they're they're good. I've never had a problem with them. Kungaloosh. If you finish the prerequisite quest in Sholazar Basin, the washed-up mage in the Dalaran sewers can teach you how to make this fruity delight. I can make that on my main. Two ounces vodka, uh, one and a quarter ounce of coconut rum, like uh, Malibu. Basically, 
three quarter ounce Midori melon liqueur. Sounds like a sweet drink. Two ounce pineapple juice, three ounce orange juice, four cups ice. The the green food coloring if you want to make it look like the green. This sounds like a straight up my wife drink, uh, right up her alley. I might even go ahead and try it for her just for fun. Let her let her try it out. Blend the first six ingredients through the ice, mixing the food coloring for an unnaturally green look. If watery, add additional ice to reach the consistency of a daiquiri. Okay. I got you. So you, that's what you want it. You want it to be like a slush. Eh. Okay. Non-alcoholic Kung Galoosh is a fruit smoothie closer to a milkshake in its consistency and richness. Add the sugar gradually as the sweetness of strawberries will determine the flavor. So instead, you're going to do frozen strawberries, orange juice, pineapple, vanilla, yogurt, and sugar. Yeah, that's basically a smoothie. Blend the first four ingredients in the blender until smooth and then stir in the sugar till it's nice and sweet. Okay. Um... That was about a quarter of our episode. Now we're going to continue with a few features here as we get near to the end. Cautious, the careful path to 80. For most, leveling a character to 80 presents enough of a challenge, but for one stalwart player, the path to 80 wouldn't have been the same unless he did it without dying by Casey Lynch. So this is way popular now. Obviously, you got your own servers. This is basically how to play hardcore. Um, and yeah, you know what? More than anything else, it's about being cautious not being like particularly skilled it's about being patient slow cautious gaining experience leveling amassing reputation dinging if you've been playing world of warcraft for a while you're likely progressed from a gray toting level one noob to a level 80 death dealing machine what you probably haven't done is to attempt to do so without dying and why would you there's currently no in-game achievement, no title, and no easy way to show off your accomplishment for Cautious, that's their name, a human protection warrior on the Kieran Tour US role-playing realm who's done the deed and lived to tell the tale. That's cool because it's a role-playing realm. Going undying wasn't about a quest for glory. He did it to break a self-imposed family curse. I figured Cautious would be an appropriate name for a character who never dies, says David Nicholson, the 41-year-old web designer from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Behind the quasi-immortal female warrior, Nicholson created the character with a specific goal of never dying, complete with a meta-narrative fit for the Warcraft canon. In my mind, it came up with a mini-backstory that involved a family curse, which prevented Cautious from being resurrected. Anytime she died, it was permanent, and a new family member with the same name was forced to begin from scratch. So how does one go about getting to level 80 without dying? Very, very carefully. I chose a warrior bit simply because I figured they have the best armor and most health, making them hardest to kill. David invested a huge amount of time in doing it right. In-game time was approximately 200 hours. <clears throat> it didn't take long for David to discover handy tools of the staying alive trade, specifically some of the perks of the engineering skill. Target dummies saved my neck on countless occasions. My favorite close call was in Howling Fjord doing the quest, The Delicate Sound of Thunder. While in a cave on the side of the cliff, I lost my disguise and suddenly found myself being attacked by a dozen or more dwarves. I tossed down a target dummy to distract them, used my nitro boost, this is back before I realized how deadly they could be, to flee to the cave entrance, and then made a mad lip, le leap off the side of the cliff and used my parachute to land safely on the beach far below. It's actually so much fun, I almost wanted to do it again. In the end, for better or worse, David says patience is the key. Trying to rush things tends to get you killed. If I felt even slightly nervous in an area, it meant that I shouldn't be there yet. The safest, most boring way of succeeding is to kill creatures eight levels below your current level. Doing just that would of course take forever and drive you completely nuts. The secret is finding a happy medium. Right, so mix some exploration and quests in there, but yeah. Essentially, just beat those monsters that right are about to turn gray. Tips for the cautious. You don't have to complete every quest you encounter. Most quests can be finished without incurring too much risk. Learn to recognize the dangerous missions and avoid them. Know your environment. If something appears to be too much of a challenge, then give it a wide berth. Accidentally tangling with elite dragons in Ultrak Mountains or startling that elite orc who wanders near Honor Hold is a no-no. Avoid instances. Even with a decent party, it's far too easy for things to go south and it's usually an awfully long escape run back to the entrance. Unlike those in other areas, instance-dwelling creatures will not give up the chase. Never fight with your back to the edge of a cliff. You just never know when an ogre might have the ability to punt you off the side of a mountain. Or when a mage has a spell to blow you off the top of their tower. Huh. Good call. That was it. Now I'll do some fan art. Um, community spotlight. Michael Jordan 
Ponsalen, visions of Azeroth from the player, Azeroth from players who live there. I are war chief. That's a cool uh, picture. I do, I do like that art style of. Um, oh geez, no, I'm drawing a blank. Even though we've read about him fifty thousand times, the guy who was chief in Cataclysm, Rexar. No, not Rexar. Um, I don't know why I can't remember his name right now. Um, Tenkan has a worgen and goblins of Cataclysm. That's a cool picture of Adrana. I don't know what she's supposed to be. She's a, like a crossbow. Maybe that's a crossbow. That is a cool picture though. That's a really cool in Jumbo one. A really cool interpretation of Adrana. Uh, a couple gnomes. Tooth. Y your turn too. Th that's actually, those are, that's all really good art. These people did a great job. All right, now the obligatory one article for each class that we do at the end of each episode. This is a rogue with an ax, probably DPS. Oh no, off tank, the off switch by Marty Cortinas. There's nothing off about being an off tank. Sometimes we have the toughest job in the room. I've tanked and off tanked in raids. When people find out that I tank in raids, I can predict the next question with a high degree of certainty. Are you the main tank? No, I'm not the main tank. Sometimes I'm a main tank. Sometimes I'm an off tank and I'm proud of it. Don't get too hung up on the slightly off-putting terminology. Off tank is really just shorthand for it. The tank managing the zillions of other things running around the room aside from the boss. And these days, no guild or standing raid group can survive by propping up a single damaged sponge. That's true. You can't. You need at least two. The encounters don't support single tanks and people being people have this annoying tendency to sometimes simply not be available on a raid night and often tanking the ostensible boss, that's the main tank's job, isn't the most demanding tanking task in the encounter. Recall rather than Lich King raiding, how many encounters were one tank affairs at the appropriate gear level of course, not when you're so overgeared the contest is just a formality, and how many encounters did you find the off tank frantically running around the room while the main tank stood at center? Take a Nubarak, where the off-tank's role was to manage the Nerubian burrowers, snagging them as they spawned before they could wander over to a hapless healer, keeping them on narrow ice patches so they didn't burrow. Movement, timing, and communication were all critical pieces of the job, and missing a stun was nearly always fatal for somebody. Think back to the Lich King himself, where your job was to tank everything but Arthas, grab ghouls, position horrors, and snag two types of spirits in such a way that they don't silence the raid. <clears throat> stun Valkyr, watch the Defile, intervene on Soul Reaper, and be ready to taunt the Lich King if the other tank's cooldowns go awry. There's so much to do, so much communication needed that you can't do this without some level of skill. And just straight up, a lot of fights are just constant tank swapping, so the off tank is really just like tank A, tank B. Consider the iron constructs in the Ignis fight. Dragging these little dudes into the fire, then to the water, and not getting blown up could either be amazingly frustrating or hugely exhilarating. And that's not to mention the countless times where your job is to swap a boss back and forth between your main tank counterpart. There you go. The big baddie wasn't pulling punches when it came to be your turn. While main tanking often seems like the glamour role in any raid team, don't let the label shortchange the contributions of the other tank or healer or DPS or crowd controller who brought just as much, if not more, to a successful fight. Yeah, and I've been in plenty of raids where even as a as a rogue, as an assassin rogue, it's been like me and the tank left, or me and a healer, or me tank healer. Like that's it. And if it wasn't for churning out the DPS numbers, there you're not going to get past the hard, the, you know, the hard cap spots. Sure, some jobs are harder than others. Some days raid healers have the weight of the world on their shoulders. Other days, some poor warlock has to play a tricky ranged tank role. But don't get too hung up on who's the main. Wear the off brand proudly. This guy's editor in chief of this magazine, and he tanks as a prop warrior. We'll never let him forget the time he took on the Northern Beast wearing a chef's hat, or the time he fought Illidan without a shield. So, yeah, those, I think he actually said that on the last episode, too. The last issue. Echoes of the Past by Naturama. More than just Azeroth has been shattered by the Cataclysm. How do we survive in a world where all the rules have changed? Check your talents for useful tools that you might have skipped. Maybe this is DPS. The first time you enter a dungeon in Cataclysm, it feels a bit like stepping out of a time machine. The world has changed, and the way we handle dungeons has been completely overturned from the way things worked in Wrath of the Lich King. 
In order to survive in the present, you have to look to the past. Take a deep breath. Think back to the very first dungeon you ever entered. The anxiety upon encountering the bosses. The exhilaration of the first loot drops. The challenge of managing threat and crowd control. Well, those days are back. This, of course, also means that we as damage dealers have to keep some things in mind that may have been forgotten during high-speed dungeon runs in Wrath of the Lich King. The dungeon philosophy in Cataclysm revolves around control. Our area of effect spells are downplayed in favor of more emphasis on crowd control. This requires a more tactical view of the dungeon's denizens as tanks need a little extra time to mark the kill order and avoid patrols before pulling it in. Give them that time and your run will go a lot more smoothly. I mean, that's just freaking instancing 101. King's a crowd control. Every class now has some form of crowd control to deal with larger packs of mobs, getting a few of them out of the way while others are being killed. Trap, sap, and polymorph are useful as always, while new glyphs ensure priests and warlocks don't send mobs in all directions when using their fear effects. Paladins can also glyph their holy wrath ability so that it stuns dragonkin and elementals, which are big players in Cataclysm. Remember that many tanks have had their ability to manage large groups of mobs reduced to make crowd control more appealing. That means it's best to let the tank control the pull and to practice your control abilities, which is like the opposite now, where threat's not even a thing. I guess that's that's true. So I guess threat's not a thing now, but but crowd controlling is still super important. That's like the main way you're contributing to the overall like defense of the fight if you're not a tank. Get familiar with the types of crowd control you can offer and check your talents for useful tools that you might have skipped for more DPS-oriented talents. Especially earlier in your dungeon career, this can mean the difference between a hard fight and a manageable one. Yeah, I mean, that happens all the time. Like, even it, uh, for me as a rogue, just making sure I'm using, um, like, a potion, uh, the, like, switching my poisons to a crippling poison or to the, the poison that reduces rage effects. Um, there's just certain instances where those are um, just game changers. Certain bosses and stuff. And, and even pick up, like, just mob packs. Threat, the one monster constantly breathing down our necks is not vanished. As our DPS improves, tanks will have a harder time keeping our foes from eating careless damage dealers alive. Cataclysm gear may have given us more health than ever before, allowing us to survive the occasional slip-up. We have to pace ourselves to keep up with what our tanks can handle. Keep one eye firmly set on your threat meter until you're convinced that your tank has everything under control. I need to turn that in on when we play Classic. At least with my pet classes, like my, or Warlock. Be a hero to a healer. Cataclysm encourages healers to watch their mana much more closely and to make smarter decisions about whom to heal using what spell. Damage dealers have a tendency to be at the bottom of healers' priority list, so try dodging damage whenever you can. If taking a hit is unavoidable, remember that everyone has some way to heal themselves, from recuperate to enraged regeneration to healing spells to passive health regeneration. Use these to spare your healer's mana for when a real emergency strikes. Since dead damage dealers deal no damage at all, being responsible about your own health bar pays off in the end. So hone your edge, reach back into your most primal World of Warcraft memories, and remember where you put those crowd control abilities. Nadarama's true name is Great Mystery as Hell Shadow, but yeah, that's the same one we did last time. Alright, and so now that was DPS, yeah, the rogue double thing, and we're going to end up with a healer. There we have a, a Draenei, almost looks like a tiefling from Dungeons and Dragons. It looks peaceful. Party of one. Yes, it's entirely possible to kill things with a healing spec. With a little care and understanding of our role strengths, we can have the best of both worlds. And now it's awesome. Now you totally can. With the launch of a new expansion comes leveling and building reputation. But don't switch to that DPS spec just yet, my healing friends. Even the most dedicated healers occasionally feel compelled to switch to a secondary spec while soloing, but it's not necessary. Healers, even when using a healing spec and gear, are just as capable of questing and earning reputation as any DPS class. Sure, we may not have the raw DPS output of a max level rogue, but with a little care and understanding of our role's strengths, we can have the best of both worlds. Carving a path through quest mobs and then hopping into an instance without giving it a second thought. When soloing as a healer, I recommend kiting targets, avoiding damage, and using a bit of hit gear. Kiting is a great way to handle multiple mobs. In my case, as a priest, I'll put Shadow Word Paint on a few targets and then run in circles a bit while the silly creatures follow me around until they die. Any area of effect or instant cast spells work well for kiting, though. Druids can use Moonfire. Shaman have their various shocks. Paladins are in a slightly different situation since they wear plate and have more limited spell damage options, but they can still use Consecrate and Holy Shock and take more hits than the rest of us while doing so. It's actually, yeah, not that hard to, 
quest as a paladin healer. That's a whole different. And honestly, shaman are pretty dang good too because they have some surefire crits. Um, druid healers. I mean, at least you can switch your form. It's meh. They they used to be terrible. They used to be the worst in the world. You're stuck with wrath, barf. Ugh. But now they're actually pretty good. For non-paladin classes in particular, a big part of successful soloing is avoiding being hit. Fortunately, we healing types have some tricks to help us accomplish this goal. Priests can use power word shield. Mm -hmm. You saw me doing that last night with Kelly a lot. Psychic scream. Druids have entangling roots in nature's grasp. I'm already getting into that on my uh, druid. I've been playing around on season of discovery. Shaman can drop an earthbind totem. Paladins are being pummeled. Can use the bubble or protection spells. Yeah, that's more like an emergency for them though. When I'm soloing, I have to remember to heal myself. I tend to get so focused on what I'm pulling, where I'm kiting, and how healthy my opponents are that I easily lose track of my own health bar. Slowly dying as an able-bodied healer is a very ironic death and quite an embarrassing one. Don't make my mistake. Keep an eye on your own health bar too, not just your enemies. The healing to spell power conversion implemented in Wrath of the Lich King helped healing spect solowers a great deal, as Cataclysm's intellect to spell power change does now. <clears throat> Intellect is almost on almost every piece of healing gear now, and each point obtained is another bit of damage done to your foe. There's an additional benefit. Damage spells are frequently expensive to cast for healing spec characters, and having a larger mana pool can be very useful. That's true. Critical strike and haste ratings are helpful as well for both healing and damage. This means that most of the cru crucial damage stats appear innately on healing gear, but there's one area where we fall short, hit rating. A low hit rating means your spells are more likely to miss, wasting mana and effort. This won't make much of a difference if you just need to kill one mob, but during a long soloing session, throwing on a piece of hit rating gear can help speed things up. Takes a bit of extra thought to solo quests and reputation mobs in a healing spec, but I find I get a greater satisfaction for that effort. I can use the gear and spells that I know so well and be prepared for any sudden healing needs. And hey, if, we all, wanted to, if all we wanted to do is demolish everything in our path, we wouldn't be playing healers in the first place. I tend to like to do that, too, to not switch my spec and just tough it out. Jessica Cook is a glutton for punishment, leveled for 180 as a holy priest. All right, so we've just got a few pages left. This is probably our, well, we've got a couple little bitty articles here. Back to the Start by Tim Edwards. Cataclysm offers your guild. we get got a picture of, it's actually a cool art, Torin, Orc Hunter, Forsaken Rogue. I don't know, Torin has a staff, maybe a... Could be a druin. Cataclysm offers your guild a new beginning, but don't forget what, you what you've what you learned from the past. Guilds are amazing things. Leading a great guild is a privilege and an honor. <clears throat> Being in a guild is the most fun I've ever had in a game, and I can't wait to introduce more players to that experience in Cataclysm. As I write this, our guild is reassembling and reorganizing. There's anticipation in the air. It feels like the calm before the storm, the darkness before the dawn. Cataclysm is coming, and hundreds of our members have begun to sharpen their rotations, read up on their classes, and prepare for the bosses. We can't wait. If you're thinking of creating a guild for Cataclysm, I'd like to impart a few lessons in how we learn from them. So it almost sounds like the game is Cataclysm's barely kicking off, and some of these articles are coming to publication before it actually shipped. Most importantly, the guild isn't about the officers or the guild leader, it's about the players as a group. As Spock once said, the needs of the many outweigh the few. This is true. In PCG, we get dozens of requests from our players asking to be made an officer, but in our guild, the officer role isn't about fun. It's about checking up on boss fights, sorting out calendars, making sure everyone is on voice chat, and motivating a raider PvP team following a wiper loss. We ask our officers to be servants to the community first, leaders second. The second point, all of World of Warcraft players have the fundamental need to have fun and feel rewarded for their effort. The game has dozens of reward mechanics including experience, achievement points, new gear, dungeon tokens, loot. The guild should be about the fun part. If you ensure you have a fair loot system, oh god, what did we do? And you rotate players in and out of your activities fairly, World of Warcraft's own systems will motivate players to take part and to enjoy themselves. The third point, consistency rules. When we first started raiding, our groups were ad hoc and we didn't settle on repeating raid nights. This was a major mistake. It took us months to progress through Nax Ramus. Kel'Thuzad kicked us to hell and back, but once we said 25 player raids would take place on Sunday and Tuesday nights, players started setting aside an evening to focus on the fight. 
our roster is solidified. We shared the experience, shared the learning, and our progress was slick. The fourth point, we want to support good ideas. Given our shambolic first attempts at 25 player rate, uh, rating, we were prepared for our newly toughened raid teams to quickly demand 10 player raids too. At first, we didn't create a structure for them to play within. It was an equal, if more dramatic shambles. Players saved to one raid would be recruited to another. Healers and tanks were in high demand. Groups fell apart before they'd even finished forming. <clears throat> we decided to formalize 10 player raiding. Groups owned by player leaders would select a knight to raid, calling themselves Team Awesome or Team Win. They worked on their own, with or without officer input. Their success was staggering. And finally, expect to fall in love. I just, just cut that and like make that like a poster to put. Screw all the rest of everything else. Just expect to fall in love. I like that. Like it's a life mantra. What I love, what I can't get over is just how many friends we've all made. Now at night when I'm not playing World of Warcraft, I'll log on to voice chat, not to talk, but to listen in, to hear and celebrate our progress, to listen in to their jokes and their casual teasing. Because the most important lesson is that a guild is a group of friends. And if you respect that, shared victories and failures will become unforgettable. So he's, this is the PC Gamer Editor-in-Chief that writes that. All right, last actual article of the issue. The world isn't ending. From Bashiok, community manager and a lover of Mexican food. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, it is, or rather, it did. But that's not what I'm talking about. Cataclysm has been released, the world has been shattered, and as people level their characters, create goblins and worgen, and dig into the new dungeons and raids, one thing should be clear. This ain't Wrath of the Lich King. In Cataclysm, the dungeon and raid philosophy has further evolved, just as it did with each expansion before it. While next Ramus, Wrath of the Lich King's first raid dungeon, had a fairly low barrier of entry, and Wrath's heroic dungeons could be readily bested if your group had a basic understanding of the boss mechanics. Cataclysm's dungeon and raid game is a different beast. With an overall boost in difficulty, more purposeful pacing of gear upgrades, and increasingly complex fight mechanics, it's more important than ever for players to understand their classes, abilities, and mechanics. And skills like crowd control are all but a necessity, even in heroic dungeons. Wrath of the Lich King made raiding more accessible to a wider range of players, but Cataclysm closes around raiders with a scaly black claw and squeezes them tight. The intent is not to create joyless, soul-crushing content. In fact, the goal is quite the opposite. While raiding in the original game and the Burning Crusade may have ultimately proven too demanding, Wrath of the Lich King swung the difficulty pendulum too far the other way. With Cataclysm, we're attempting to find a balance that ensures that the game is challenging to a point where victory is achievable, but not so difficult that raids are a daunting experience to anyone but the hardest of the hardcore. Yeah, and I don't think it's quite like that with Classic now. Somewhere in the middle. One major catalyst for the philosophy shift was that in Wrath of the Lich King, players lost their sense of accomplishment too quickly. Most players were able to roll through dungeons as they leveled, completed most heroics with little difficulty, and in many cases jumped straight into Naxxramas with little or no preparation and were able to progress fairly well without much need for coordination. The opposite can be true as well, of course. If content is tuned to be too difficult, a group of players may eventually feel they have no way to progress, leading to frustration and discouragement. The goal of the endgame in Cataclysm is to find that elusive middle ground. Take note, you will die, your groups will wipe, probably over and over, but each wipe should teach you a lesson and give you something to improve upon. We want Cataclysm's challenges to be surmountable, but we also want to make sure players need to take their time to learn the encounters, understand them, and work together to overcome them, and feel like they've accomplished something great when they finally do. World of Warcraft is never going to be perfect. There will always be class adjustments to make and bosses to balance, but each expansion, each raid, and each encounter teaches us another valuable lesson, and we'll continue to make our changes with the Cataclysmic goal of difficult but achievable in mind. We believe that the sense of accomplishment you'll feel when you finally do achieve that goal of a boss down or a wing clear will make it all worth it. You'll celebrate with your group, feel proud, and know that Deathwing is that much closer to the blade of your sword. I have to say, when they say that, you know, it's never going to be perfect, Blizzard's just not going to get it perfect. Um, they just don't. 
Right now, for an example, I'm playing Diablo 4. I wasn't blown away by Season 1. Um, it was okay. Season 2 has been a lot better. You feel good. Um, it's an improvement. And then they just put this patch out yesterday or today. And it's a nightmare. It's it, They put it out today. They did the biggest mistake ever. You spend so much time. The majority of your end game is leveling up your glyphs. It's like the last thing I'm working on before I've completed every season goal. And you have to get <clears throat> five of your glyphs, which is basically the max you can have equipped of your Paragon glyphs to max level, which is 21. And I had like four out of my five glyphs maxed out. And then they did this patch, which was going to make leveling your glyphs easier by increasing the XP of every run. But they increased the amount of XP that it would take to level your glyphs at the same time. Like what, what the, what the absolute heck I, I can't, I just can't fathom why you needed to do that kind of calculus. Why mess with it at all? Because what they did and what it did was D level all of my previously max level glyphs. So it's not like they're retroactively giving me the XP. If things were supposed to be easier and it all should have shook out about the same if you were going to max out your, your glyphs, <clears throat> they should have just let you keep your previous levels of glyphs because then, you know, whatever. you, you if, if it was going to be quicker now, okay, you already put in the work. But instead, it's like the worst of both worlds. My character is now de-leveled in power. Lost a lot of his, his end game power. I now have to go back previously maxed out glyph, glyphs and grind multiple dungeons to fix mm -hmm. them. So it's going to take me at least 20 nightmare dungeons probably uh, to max them all back out just to where I had it before, even at this new higher rate that you get. So <clears throat> it's very frustrating. And they say, well, you can just make it up so fast with this new thing. Well, I haven't done, I haven't unlocked that yet because I need to complete one more season task. And that was my last one that I was working on. So it's just, it's, it's the dumbest idea. Never, ever, 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 ever should you push out a, sure, nerf things, whatever. Never should you push out a patch that de-levels your people. It's not like the stat squish where this is a new max level across <clears throat> the board and then you're going to now progress through a new expansion. They just, they just de-leveled you. And now you have to regrind the XP to get back to where you already were. That is <clears throat> the worst. Also, just do better math. Just do a different equation. If you want the whole grind to ultimately be the same, don't freaking change it. Or just change the XP requirements for the first pieces, but not the end pieces. Don't change the max total number of, of XP. It's just the worst. It just the worst. I, it's, sorry, that's my rant for the day. Like, <clears throat> I'll get over it. It's There's still plenty of time left in the season. Um, <clears throat> but it's 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 just an example of, I, I just don't know who thought it was an idea, a good idea. And if they didn't realize, they're like, oh, we're working on a fix. There's no f easy fix for that. Um, and they said they push it out on PC today and then the, at consoles, they'll somehow push out. Just don't, just... If you can't make the, the deadline, don't make the deadline. And like someone should, someone's job should be on thin ice for this kind of thing. It's a bad move. It's just a bad move. <clears throat> like all the good grace that they've, they've accumulated so far this season, they've burned. All right, well, let's finish up our issue now that my rant's done. With uh, Gnome versus Goblin second ep here. We've got a goblin here. He's going to start a race between a, it. looks like a trike and a rocket bike. Fire in the gum. The gnome whistles. As he's whistling, boom, the gun goes off. And the goblin zooms out on his ro rocket before the second half of the word bang comes out. The gnome is watching on his trike. The goblin is laughing. <laughs> he's almost at the finish line when the gnome puts his goggles on, sights up his scope, Presses the button and then clicks something just in time to 
I don't know what he's doing. Using a gravity reverser, and the, the goblin screams, yeah, and he flies up into the air, in which case he slowly pedals his trike, the gnome does, across the finish line where the goblin explodes in midair. And here's the back cover. Oh, that's actually a very cool Blood Elf Paladin. That says next issue. You get that one, and there's the back cover. So next issue will be our final issue. And uh, this one in the pipe 5x5. Five five. Thank you guys so much for watching, for listening to me rant. And I'll see you on the next episode of Lore of Warcraft. Peace out.